prayer. Thank you, Father God, for your word that does not return void. Thank you, Lord, that the atmosphere has changed as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I thank you that our hearts are open, that our minds are tuned in to the word that you have for us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to be moving throughout this message, bringing us into a deeper relationship with yourself. God, if there's anybody in this sanctuary that doesn't know you as Christ their Savior, Lord, would you bring them to that knowledge today? Lord, I pray that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth would be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? You all awake? Have your coffee? Otherwise known as worship. That's our, that's our coffee for the morning. I want to talk to you about this, uh, this message that God laid on my heart called uh, living in abundance. We've been in our series called Always Abounding, and it's where uh, we're trying to move through some principles on how we can see God bring forth abundance in our life so that we can have uh, everything that we need for every work that God has called us to. And uh, I love the scripture in 1 Corinthians 9, 8 that tells us God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And the Apostle Paul wrote that scripture in the context of him collecting an offering for the Jerusalem Christians who were facing great persecution and they were having their property seized. And so in the context of contributing of our, of our financial resources, Paul says, God opens up a grace over your life, a grace of abounding. How many could use a grace of abounding over their life this morning? Amen? A grace of abounding. And so it's God's unmerited favor. I want to talk to you about a story of a farmer. And there was this farmer who found out about this new seed for his crops that would produce more than all of the other farmers in his area. And so he began to uh, purchase the seed and began to utilize it. And he saw that a great harvest uh, came from using this new seed that had been engineered to produce more uh, of, a, of a harvest for his crop. And so when his neighbors found out that he was using this new special kind of, uh, uh, of engineered crop, uh, they said, hey, can I buy some of the seeds from your crop so that we can also use that on our farms uh, to provide for our families and our income? But the farmer said, no, absolutely not. I will not allow you to do that. I want to, I want to have a monopoly in this area. The farmer became selfish. But as the years went on, he began to notice that his crops were becoming less and less every year. And he began to be a little bit perplexed, saying, I'm using the same seed. Why is it not producing the crop that I originally had? Come to find out after he did an investigation, the, the neighboring crops of the farmers that he decided not to give the seed to were cross-pollinating with his. And every year, his crop began to diminish more and more. And I think the moral of the story that we need to take to heart as we get ready to enter into the message is that we'll never really get away with selfishness in life. When we begin to have a, a scarcity mindset where we try to keep everything to ourselves and, and not be a giver, then all of a sudden, the laws of nature begin to work against us. The laws that God has instituted into the universe begin to work against us. And that's what happened with the farmer. How many can relate to that story this morning? Times that you've been selfish, you thought, that, that's going to provide me more. Somehow, it did not work out as you planned. And that's, that's something we need to learn as it relates to the way that God has arranged the universe. Did you know that the, the, the Bible talks about money and possessions over 2,000 times? 2,000 times. How many of you in here have kids? You raise your hand real quick. And, and let me remind you, and maybe, maybe some of your parents can, can relate to this, but how many of you, one of the first five words that your kid learned was mine? Can you, at least the, the top ten words that they learned in their life. Mine. We, we found out that our kids learned no really quick. No. No. Hey, go do this. No. Hey, give, give that to your brother. Share your toy. Mine. It's pre-wired in us from early on to be selfish. The Bible says that we have all inherited 
a sin nature uh, from the fall of Adam. And Adam passed down his sin nature to us. And as a result, we're born with a selfish attitude. How many of you had to teach your kids how to lie? Did you have to sit down, hey, Johnny, when you're about to get in trouble for something that you told me that wasn't true, here's what you do. You tell me something that's not true. Okay? All right, let's try this. Johnny, what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> Another example of how our nature is already fallen from early, from early on. Us, when I was a kid, I didn't have to learn how to lie. I didn't have to learn how to steal. I didn't have to learn how to take my brother's toys. I didn't have to learn any of that. That was something pre-wired in us. And so God has instituted certain practices as Christians for us to be able to put the sin nature to death in our life. And so I want to help rearrange your mindset on how you view possessions and finances. This is not a message on Here's, here's what you need to do. No, this is a message on who God has called us to be so that we're no longer walking in the things of darkness, walking in the things of our flesh, walking in the things that we are not called to be in as Christians and as a body of believers. So, God knows that money and possessions are the number one competition with Him in our life. That's why He talks about it over 2,000 times. He understands that the biggest temptation that we all will face in life is that very thing. That's why Jesus turned to the rich young ruler and he said, it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle than for, uh, for him to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The eye of the needle, needle was, a, was a very small gate entering into Jerusalem. Then at nighttime, they would deliver goods into the city. And for a camel to be able to get through that into the city, he would have to get down on his knees and begin to crawl. Notice what Jesus is saying. If, if you are someone who is tempted by money and possessions, that it's important that you live your life on your knees. Because that is going to begin to compete with, with your heart for God. And we have to understand that that is something pre-wired in us from birth. So, last week we talked about the scarcity cycle. Roger talked about how you consume, you lack, and then you fear. You consume, you lack, you fear. And all of a sudden that mindset begins to create a scarcity within our life. We're always focused on what we're missing rather than the ability of God to provide abundantly for everything that we need. And so this morning, we want to continue to build on that concept. And I want to start with uh, your first fill in the blank that says, the scarcity cycle starts in the mind, not in the wallet. The scarcity cycle starts in the mind, not in the wallet. Proverbs chapter 23, <coughs> verse 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, from my boring days at the cemetery, I mean seminary, we learned that there are certain places in the scripture where they didn't really know exactly where to put the comma. Because when you translate from Greek or Hebrew to English, it's a little different uh, how they structure those languages. So we have to give our best shot at where would the comma go here. And here is a actually debatable passage. And I tend to believe that the comma should be right after thinks. For as he thinks, comma, in his heart, so is he. You see how that you see how that begins to make a difference? As I think, it begins to be what I'm dwelling on, what I'm meditating on, the pattern of my mind then translate to the, to the condition of my heart, which then translates to the condition of my life. Can anybody uh, relate to that process? And so what is the key to pushing the wrong things out of your heart? Start getting the right things into your mind. We've got to have the attitude of faith that the Bible calls us to have. We have to have the attitude of devotion 
of allowing the Word of God to be the guidepost that leads us forward into the things that He has for us. And so as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, I want to take you to a passage in Mark chapter 6, verse 34 through 38. And I'll give you a scenario in which we will begin to talk about this, how scarcity begins in the mind, not in the wallet. It tells us, uh, beginning in verse 34, that when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. And as you may know, the story goes that Jesus took that, that small contribution of, of resources and he multiplied it in such a way that he was able to feed the 5,000 families that were there. Now it's important to understand it wasn't just 5,000 people because the way that they, they would count a census in those days was just counting the men. And so when they counted the men, there were 5,000 men present in the crowd, but that would mean there was up to 20,000 people there to feed with simply five, uh, a serving of five, a serving of five. And so the disciples were thinking differently than Jesus thought. Also, they were thinking, buy, buy. Purchase. Jesus was thinking, give. He said, do you realize how much we would have to buy to feed all of these people? Jesus said, give. Give them what you got. Give them what you got. And Jesus approached it from a completely different mindset. It's what I like to call the abundance mindset. So there are those two mindsets. The mindset of scarcity and the mindset of, of abundance. And my prayer is that as we deal with this, you'll begin to see areas of your thinking that need to be corrected. The reason that we gather together on a Sunday is for the preaching of God's word to go forth and change the way that we think. That's why we pray before the service that, that the Holy Spirit would come and anoint the word that is coming forth so that it can begin to shatter faulty thinking. And so I want to encourage you, if you've been coming to church for a little bit of time or for a lot of bit of time, have you been coming for your mind to be changed? Or is it just to do the ritual? Because if we're just doing the ritual, it's not really going to produce much fruit. We ought to come in here with an attitude that says, God has something for me today that's going to change the way I'm thinking, which is going to change the experience that I'm having in my day in and day out life. So, a couple of people I want to bring to you from the scriptures who had the scarcity mindset. Well, Peter did in this passage. If you look at the, the version that the Apostle John gives in John chapter 6, verse 7 through 9, it shows Peter with a scarcity mindset. Here's, here's what we see. It says, Philip answered him, uh, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Excuse me, I meant, I meant Andrew, not Peter. He, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So Andrew, Peter's brother, began to look at what they had. And he began to say, what are we going to do? How far will this really go? He was thinking, Jesus, I've seen you heal the sick. I've seen you make uh, blind people see. I've seen you make people who, who were lame walk. But what do you mean just pass out five loaves of bread and fish? How far will this go? Andrew was thinking from the attitude of scarcity. He was doing an inventory of what they had instead of what God was able to do. 
How many of us begin to do that in our life? I'm not telling you to use a lack of wisdom in your financial uh, dealings within your household. But I'm, I'm asking you to really challenge yourself and ask, am I obeying God in that area? Am I looking at my financial situation from the standpoint of, here's what I have. I've been there. My wife and I have uh, discussions all of the time as it relates to budgeting. And I have a very analytical mind, so I like to have it all planned out. But there has to be room in the budget. There has to be a, a, a guiding principle in the budget that points to Jesus. We can't allow ourselves to say, this is all I have, so I'm unable to bless others. We'll live our entire life without ever getting to experience the, the promise of the scripture that Jesus gave. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And yet, we always find a reason not to give. Because we look at it from the same standpoint that Andrew did. And isn't that encouraging to you today? That even one of the twelve is someone who struggled with a scarcity mindset. That if you have, if you have had a, a, a lifelong battle in the area of how do I obey God as it relates to my finances, that that doesn't make you disqualified for the kingdom. That even Jesus' disciples struggled with the same attitude. But as they began to learn from their rabbi, from their teacher, Jesus, they began to think differently. Another person from the scripture that I want to talk to you about is Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist. And he also took upon himself what we call the scarcity mindset. The angel Gabriel came to him. He was a priest in the temple. And the angel came and said, uh, Zechariah, you've been praying for a child, for a baby, and your wife has been as well. We're going to give you the baby, and he's going to be a great man of God. Zechariah looked at his physical condition. He said, I am young at heart. You guys get to play on words there? We have the young at heart meeting coming up. He said, but angel, I'm young at heart. How could we have a baby? I'm not young in the body, I'm only young in the heart. How do we have a baby? And the angel turned to him and said, because you doubted my word, you're not going to be able to speak until the promise comes to pass. He looked at it on the basis of the physical circumstance. In the same way that Andrew said, but, but we only have this small amount of food here. Jesus, you're asking me to do something that challenges my faith. How dare you? Oh my goodness, wow, God's asking us to do something that challenges our faith. What an amazing thought. Did you know that the Christian walk is an unending cycle of God challenging our faith to go to the next level? And so when we take a month out of the year and we begin to talk about the abundance that God brings to our life as we begin to become faithful givers that walk in an abundance mindset rather than a, a, a mindset of scarcity. We're not talking about, uh, you know, you having to do something that is uh, rigid or religious. We're talking about us allowing God to challenge our faith to the next level and begin to grow our life in a special way that cannot happen apart from obedience to his word. God always has our best interest in mind as it relates to anything that he asks us to do in the word of God. There are two people that I want to talk about, Jesus being one of them in this passage, but also Abraham, because Abraham gives a very interesting parallel to Zechariah. Given a very similar promise by God, Abraham was told a few times, that he was going to have a child of promise. And that that child was going to be a blessing to all nations. Through that lineage would come the Savior. And Abraham began to get well along in years. And God came to him and his wife and reminded him, I'm going to fulfill the promise that I gave you. Guess what his wife did? She laughed. She laughed. And that's why they named their baby Isaac, which means he laughs. Named their kids laugh. Because God, God showed them who was really laughing. 
But the Bible says something different about Abraham's attitude in the book of Romans up on the screen. It tells us that without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. He also did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Look at what Abraham did as it relates to the promise of God. He began to give him glory for it. He began to say, I'm thanking you right now, Lord Jesus, that the promise has been stated, therefore it will happen. When my faith begins to get discouraged, I begin to speak God's word. I begin to give glory to him for it. I begin to thank him for it. I begin to remind myself of what he said. The Bible says to meditate on his word day and night. So I want to I want I want to state to you this morning, if you're walking in a scarcity mindset, it's probably because you're meditating on the wrong thing. You're meditating on the circumstance. You're Meditating on the condition that you're facing. I dare you to begin to meditate on the promise of God that says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And realizing that promise was given in the context to Christians who learned to faithfully give of their resources to the kingdom work of God. Notice Jesus' mindset led to an incredible miracle. Matthew chapter 14, verses 20 says, They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. over. And that tells us that Jesus had a more than enough mindset. Do you have a more than enough mindset? Do you, do you believe that God wants to bless you abundantly? And I'm not just talking about resources financially. That's nothing for God. I don't want you to get caught up on the love of money. I don't want to get you to get up, caught up on pursuing the things of this world. But I don't want you to live in a mindset that says, Well, God, I'm, I'm kind of coming up short again. I don't know what to do. God wants us to live in the confidence of his provision. And we demonstrate and exercise our faith towards that prom uh, promise in our faithful giving. So the giving is an act of faith more than it is an act of contribution. We're continually telling God, I believe you in this area. And that's just one area of our life, but it's a very important one. Because Jesus said, where your money is, there your heart is also. In other words, if you want to know where a person's heart is, take a look at their bank statement. Because whatever you love, that's what you give towards. That's what you utilize resources for. And so God is challenging us to grow <coughs> in intimacy with him as it relates. That's the whole point of everything. It would be a tragedy and a travesty if Roger and I skipped this subject every year. And said, you know, we don't really want to offend. We don't want people that thinking that we're all about the money. Listen, I'd encourage you to schedule a meeting with Brian Watson, our, Watson, our financial administrator. And you'll find out real quick that it's not all about the money. It's more all about the praying that the money might come. <laughs> That's where God continues to test our faith. But every year, we take time to let God challenge yours as well so that we can obey him in that area. Are you busy looking at your circumstances this morning? Have you been doing that your whole life? Saying, but I can't. I can't, Lord. We need to have a more than enough attitude. I'm talking about disciples. You know, I know as I'm speaking right now, many of you who are suffering financially are just saying in yourself, but God, if you don't know my situation, you just don't understand. If you just saw the bills that were stacking up on my dining room table, you would get it. And I'm talking about 12 disciples who stood together looking at at least 20,000 people. And, 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 it's, and, and they wanted to reason with Jesus the same way that we do. But, but Jesus, do you see the 20,000 people? And you're asking me to give everything I have? 
right here and right now? I cannot believe that you would do that, Jesus. 20,000 people versus maybe five to 10 bills on your dining room table. Maybe if we begin to obey God as it relates to this area of obeying him with our finances, maybe those bills that are stacking up and sitting there for weeks and weeks will stop sitting there so long. Maybe, maybe, don't, maybe you need to lay your hands on those bills and say, Father, I gave this week, therefore you're going to give back to me. Press down, shaken together, running over. You're going to cause men to get into my bosom. Father God, I declare your word. I am asking you to meet all of my needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Amen? I, I've seen Christians step up to the plate in that area. And they begin to see God move in supernatural ways. They begin to break the cycle of scarcity and live in the place of abundance. Living in the place of abundance doesn't mean you're going to automatically be rich. But your needs will be provided for. You won't live in fear anymore. You won't look at your challenges as something that are too big for God to overcome. You'll begin to view life from a standpoint of victory rather than defeat. You'll begin to view life from a standpoint of overcoming, of being more than a conqueror rather than always just barely making it. God wants you to have your needs met. And he wants you to have something left over to give to others. So why don't you begin to believe God in that regard? And maybe God is waiting for you to put him first in this area before he chooses to open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blood. Because he knows if he did open the windows of heaven on you right now, all you would do would be keep giving to yourself. But if he knows that you are taking the steps to be a faithful contributor to the work of his kingdom, you better believe he's going to make that happen. He said... The Lord said that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of the things that we need will be added to us. But we get it backwards. We try to add all the things we need to ourselves first and then seek the kingdom of God afterwards. And lo and behold, we never get to the seeking the kingdom of God. God say, put me first. Put me first. And then you will see me begin to take your life to a new life. Amen? Scarcity looks, this is your second fill of the blank. Scarcity asks, what can I afford? Abundance asks, what do I have? Because there's more where that came from. In order to begin living in abundance, we must understand God's desire for our life. The Bible paints a parallel between the desire of God for your life and the desire of the enemy for your life. In John 10, verse 10, it tells us that the, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Zoe is the Greek word there. That is the spiritual life of God in abundance as we're putting him first in every area. You've got to believe when the favor of God is on your life, it's going to begin to cause every other area of your life to grow. Take Joseph, for example, in the Old Testament, who put God first in everything, even when he faced wretched circumstances of being sold into slavery, being placed into prison. He put God first, and the Bible says that God made him a success in everything that he did. And that's what I'm declaring over your life, that if you will choose today to begin to put God first in this area, Everything you do will prosper because his favor will be over your life. People will look at you and they will see that the Lord is with you. The Bible even says that of Potiphar, a, an Egyptian slave owner, a, a, an Egyptian government official who didn't know the Lord. He looked at Joseph, who was putting God first, and he says, man, God is with them. And, and I'm going to put him over my entire household. So... God's blessing on your life does not delete persecution and hardship. As a matter of fact, Joseph putting God first and believing the dreams that God had given him actually put him into a lot of trials. But through every trial, Joseph was elevated. God took his enemy and made it into his footstool. God began to lift Joseph's life up 
from the miry clay and set his feet upon a rock. And so I'm not giving you a message of give and everything will go perfectly in your life. I'm saying when you put God first, no matter what comes your way, it's going to be like water off of a duck's back. God's going to elevate you through it. He's going to grow your life. He's going to begin to bless you abundantly so that at all times and all things, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen? Amen. So, why do we miss out on God's abundant life? Number one, this is a fill in the blank for you, is that we don't realize that God multiplies what is blessed. God multiplies what is blessed. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 40 through 41, that they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. He blessed the food. And I want you to know this morning that God has blessed already in his word the practice of faithfully giving to his kingdom work. God multiplies what is blessed. That is the practice of faithful giving to the kingdom work of God is something that God has said, I bless that. That's something that I will multiply. That is something that will cause your life to grow. Look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Look at the principle here. He's already blessed the financial giving to the storehouse, which is the, which is the place where ministry takes place to the people of the world. And that in that, God is saying, test me, and I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. I will throw open abundance over your life. It's a promise from God. When we bring what is blessed to God, we can expect to see multiplication in every area of our life. The scarcity mindset says, I'm not sure if I can give faith. The abundance mindset says, I can't afford not to. The abundance mindset says, I can't afford not to. Has that been your mindset? Or has it been, I don't know if I can afford that. Listen, I understand there's financial suffering in our lives. That's why our prayer partners pray every week that everyone in the church facing financial difficulty will have a solution to that problem. Amen. That those who are working in our, in our midst will have good work ethic, will be loyal, faithful, honorable employees. We can't expect God's richest blessing if we are not walking in his ways as it relates to our job. I also believe that if you don't have a job, your job is to work 40 hours a week finding a job. Amen. Amen. So, so I'm just warning you, I'm, I'm inviting you to come meet with me and Pastor Roger if you don't have a job, and then I will recommend to you, yes, you do have a job. You have a 40 hour a week job to find a job. And then when you find a job, you're going to honor God in what he has done for you. You're going to trust him. And he's going to provide more than enough in your life. I'm trying to be very kind to you this morning. I'm trying to give you the key that will keep your life from just staying at one place. I want your life to go forward. I can tell you from mine and Amanda's journey, early on when I began to follow the Lord Jesus in my calling, I decided that that was a non-negotiable in my life. I worked serving tables. I had a full apartment rent, utilities, food. I was 20 years old with all of those different things that had to be met. I served tables for a living, which isn't, you don't get rich doing that. But I decided if I don't put God first in this area, I'll be serving tables for the rest of my life. And there's nothing wrong with serving tables. I just didn't want to stay there. That wasn't where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. It was certainly a huge blessing to my life while God had me there. But I decided I was going to give my way into a new future. And God provided every step of the way. 
supernatural opportunities. I don't have enough time to tell you all of the doors that God began to open the moment that I began to trust Him in this area. And I believe that's a word for somebody in here today. You have all these dreams and visions from God in your heart. You have all these desires for His best in your life. He's waiting on you to meet Him where He's standing. When you begin to put Him first in every area, you're going to begin to see those doors that you've been waiting to open. Fly open. You're going to see the floodgates of heaven open over your life. I hope that you don't settle for scarcity. And when I say scarcity, I'm not just talking about the number in your bank account. I'm talking about the experience that you're having. God desires for you to have the fullness of joy. He doesn't want us to walk around broke, busted, and disgusted. He wants us to be thriving, prospering, making a difference in the world. If anybody's going to be in control of the world's finances, I think it should be Christians. Amen. I mean, aren't we tired of the wicked being in control of all the finances? Mm -hmm. What if us Christians began to trust God in this area, and then he began to reroute the world's wealth to our pockets where we can make a difference for the kingdom? Rather than us seeing the perpetuation of evil every single day. If the church would just believe in it. It starts with us. I want to tell you the story of a couple that I heard about from a, a pastor uh, in another church. There was a couple that was attending his church and, and they, God was convicting them in the area of giving. And they finally one day decided to start having <coughs> an abundance mindset. They quit tipping God, as Roger talked about last week. And they began to say, we're going to do this from the mindset of abundance from here on out. <coughs> and they didn't know what to expect. But all of a sudden, they began to show up at church on Sunday. And as they began to worship the Lord, tears began to stream down their face. They began to experience an intimacy with God and one another. They couldn't understand it. What? Me putting God first in my finances is translated to a better marriage? But you know what that meant? Is we always draw this diagram of a triangle. And if you could just picture it right here, triangle. And you're at one corner, your spouse is on the other corner, and God's up at the top. And as you and your spouse are growing towards God, you're growing towards one another. And what, what happened is they didn't realize it, but that principle began to unfold. They began to put God first in that area and many other areas of their life. And as a result, their intimacy with God began to increase their intimacy with one another began to increase. And their marriage began to be restored. And it was a beautiful thing. I hope that that's an encouragement for some of you this morning. That as you grow closer to God, God will bring you and your spouse closer. Now, there may be a season, if you have a spouse that's resistant to the things of God, there's going to be a season of discontentment. But here's the thing. Even if your spouse is growing away from the Lord and you're growing towards the Lord, you're still growing closer to your spouse. Instead of you growing away from the Lord and your spouse growing away from the Lord at the same time. Either way, it's a winning situation. And the Bible promises that you and your whole household will be saved if, you're, if you put your faith in Him. He did it with Noah. He did it with the Philippian jailer. He did it with Rahab. He did it with so many families in the Bible that you can begin to believe God to bring your whole household into faith as you put him first. So I want to I want to begin to give you uh, another fill in the blank that helps us to understand how to live abundantly. We have to understand that God multiplies what is given away. God multiplies, number one, what is blessed. Number two, what is given away. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 19. It says, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples <coughs> gave them to the people. I want to also share with you, in, uh, before we begin to uh, move into the next part, uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 through 20, uh, 24 through 25. It says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And so you see the disciples walking in this principle. Maybe you're needing a refreshing in your life. 
I believe you need to begin refreshing others. That's the way that the kingdom of God works. I'll close with this. We live in a backwards kingdom. As Christians, when you receive Christ, you receive a new spirit. God deposits his spirit within you. But you don't get a brand new brain. I know some of us would enjoy that, including myself. I wish God would just put a brand new brain in my head when I got saved. But you still have the old thinking here. And that old thinking will contend with the new spirit that is within you. This is why we have to understand that in God's kingdom, instead of running people over to get more, he says, give. In God's kingdom, in order to be elevated, you don't try to climb the ladder of success in the traditional way. The Bible says whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever is first will be last. Whoever's last will be first. So if we want to walk in an abundance mindset, if we want to apply the renewing of the mind to our life, we have to understand that God is asking us to do things that are going to challenge our faith. And it's going to be opposite to what your flesh wants to do. But in that, we will begin to experience all that God has created you to be. Amen? Amen. What led Jesus to feed these 20,000 people? The, the, the passage begins with saying that when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. What led Jesus to demonstrate to us this abundance mindset? His compassion. Jesus wasn't consumed with himself. He was consumed with others and their well-being. You remember the, the baby analogy, mind? Jesus wasn't a mind kind of guy. He had compassion on the multitude. Therefore, he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We never close our services without giving you an opportunity to start fresh with God. I know there are some in this room that say, Pastor Kyle, I could really use a fresh start. That time is now. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. There's never a better time to start your relationship with God. Jesus was the eternal creator who became a man. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross on, uh, in your place for your sin so that you can be forgiven. He rose from the dead on the third day to authenticate the reality of who he is. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms, standing as our advocate, saying, forgive them, Father, forgive them. And he invites all of us, whosoever will, let them come drink of the water of life this morning. So I'd like to close out in prayer, giving you an opportunity to respond. Let's bow our heads. If the Lord is tugging on your heart, if the Holy Spirit is beckoning you, saying, come drink of the waters of life this morning, I want you to pray this prayer from your heart and mean it to God. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I make you my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you all of my days. Renew me, revive me, empower me to be everything you created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to give you, if you would stand with me, we're going to give you an opportunity, if you prayed that prayer, to come down and make a public profession of faith. The Bible says that whoever confesses me before my Father in heaven, I will confess. Uh, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. I want to invite you forward, starting with our impact team leaders over here.
at our prayer partners over here. If, if you're a prayer partner in the church, would you make your way over to this side? If you prayed that prayer, come over here and tell one of these impact group leaders that you prayed that prayer. If you need prayer this morning, you say, I'm rededicating my life to Jesus, and I need prayer. I'd like to have our prayer workers over here to receive. Come on down and receive prayer from us as we sing this song.